Okay, good evening everyone. Thanks very much for joining us today. My name is Hilary and uh, I'm just going to go into a very quick one minute spiel before we start the session proper. So um, I'm from the Singapore Global Network, which is SGN for short, which is currently a division under the Economic Development Board of Singapore. Together with some folks from the community, including Jason and Jin Shi, we've set up Tech Plus 6.5, uh, which is an online community at this point in time because everything is only virtual, uh, to bridge the tech community based in Singapore with other Singaporeans and friends of Singapore all, all over the world. Um, as part of a series of virtual events, we have been holding uh, many different topics and discussions. And today we're very happy to have Jason and Jinshi here with us to talk about uh, product management. So without further ado, I'll let um, them take over the time and uh, share with us what they will be speaking on today. Okay, thanks Hilary and thanks uh, to the SGN team for putting everything together. Um, I think we're going to put up the slides soon. Um, but before we jump into that, um, so welcome everyone. Thanks for hanging out with us. We're trying a new format where we're doing it at 8 o'clock instead of the previous time, I think it was at 10 or 11 o'clock because we were trying to think about, you know, whether we should try to catch the US time zones. Um, but I think that is where we can apply this decision tree theory later on as well to figure out when is the best time to host webinars. Um, but before we jump into it, so Jason and I actually met back in 2012 when we were both at Penn. Um, and so before, you know, we, we jump into the topic and everything, I think today the plan uh, is to introduce ourselves and then we'll have about maybe half an hour of content where Jason will be sharing a lot of insights um, from his time uh, at Carousel and how he applied decision trees uh, into his product management work. Um, and then we'll be taking some questions um, and then we'll also have some, you know, live Q&A at the end, depending on how far we make it here. Um, so without further ado, I think that we can start um, with maybe Jason, why don't you tell us about yourself, your background, what you do, um, you know, and what is product management at Carousel? Yeah, um, thanks JX. Uh, yeah, so I, I had my resume up there and this was in the email as well. Really the, the most important point is, is the first line. Um, and it's important because the, the rest of this uh, presentation today um, will basically be like example after example from Carousel, right? Um, so I'll also like take you guys through a little bit later what is Carousel, but I've been in product management now um, about roughly the past uh, eight, nine years. I've um, also uh, started and, and run a company with a uh, Chinese, com uh, Chinese unicorn actually, although unicorns there are a little bit like different definition, much bigger, um, called Zuba Jie. Uh, so I've run a variety of roles, um, you know, big companies, small companies. Um, and, you know, when I, and I remember when I like, first started doing product management um, in uh, 2010, actually, like way back then, I don't even think this discipline really like existed. I think JX uh, can, can maybe um, kind of resonate with this as well. Um, but, you know, I've had to learn a lot of the things along the way by myself. Um, and so I'm really happy to kind of share and maybe start a dialogue with some of you guys um, about how we can kind of continue to improve and build this community here in Singapore together. Awesome. Um, and Jason, could you speak a bit um, about like what is the structure of product management at Carousel? Um, how big is the team? You know, how do you guys think about dividing the teams? Is it by roles or functions? Yeah, uh, so, so that's, a, that's a good question. Um, so, so I think Carousel is... Uh, interesting because I think we're much smaller than a lot of people think, um, at least in terms of our product team. So we have um, all in all uh, about less than 10 product managers um, and we are um, split into like different buckets of work. So I am director of product for one bucket, um, handling monetization and all initiatives linked to that. Um, there is another bucket um, handled by a, a director of growth who handles growth. And then the last bucket um, handled by uh, payments and shipping. So there's another director there. And what's really interesting is that like we, we while we all report into the function, um, to the CTO, we actually have a, what, what I call a three-dimensional matrix, right? So we have a dotted line to a squad lead. I think squads are very popular these days. And then we have another like semi-transparent, translucent line to country managers. Um, so, you know, uh, we're a relatively lean team, but, you know, I, I once counted like in one, one of my PMs, like how many people he had to um, kind of get sign-offs for on his roadmaps and there were like 26, right? So there are many, many more stakeholders than, are, than there are product managers. 
But um, I mean, it's, it's a company that's doing very well, but still we try and maintain some of that leanness in our product management. Nice. So before we move on, what was the last item that you bought or sold on Carousel? <laughs> uh, yeah, it is a, uh, I'm, I'm an uh, audio file. So I, I sold a couple of my like, speaker amplifiers. Like, um, you know, they're more to look at than to listen to. Yeah, so if anybody has a hobby, I think you can resonate with that, that mindset. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks, Jason. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So I think, uh, you know, your, your turn to introduce yourself. We have a slide for you as well. Um, yeah. So, hey guys, I'm JX. Um, so uh, I started my career at EB. So it's great to it almost feels like home with Hillary. Uh, and I see a few of our ex coworkers here. Uh, I think shout out to Joshua and Yuan Jun. Um, you know, at EDB, I was working uh, on trying to get um, tech companies to invest in it. But after about two and a half years, I think it's always more fun to be part of the industry than to just be, you know, on a periphery. So after about two and a half years, I left and moved over to San Francisco, where I started my career at Dropbox. Um, I started first as a data scientist before transitioning to be a product manager. And I was working on things like Dropbox Paper, um, as well as Dropbox Teams, which is our SMB product. Um, after Dropbox, um, I moved over to Lyft. So that was when ride sharing was going crazy and you know the whole Dewey Uber and experiencing all of that. But I think, um, and, and at Lyft, I was working on driver pricing. So figuring out how much to pay drivers as well as to calculate the incentives and how do we encourage drivers uh, to drive for Lyft um, than at Uber. Um, after about four to five years um, in the Valley, um, I kind of felt a bit Silicon Valley out. Um, and that was when, in, back in 2018, China was, was really coming up. Um, and so I told my wife one morning, like, you know, we should just move to China, which is pretty crazy because for people who know me, they know that I can't really speak Mandarin well. But, you know, um, what have you got to lose? And so I joined ByteDance and I, um, at ByteDance, uh, I was working on launching a new product. We actually shipped it about four months ago. Uh, it's called Reso and it's ByteDance's music streaming app. Um, to compete against Spotify and Apple Music. Um, but long story short, as with all good Singaporeans, um, my wife and I had a kid, and so nine months ago, we decided to move back. Um, and that was when I found a really small company called Endowis, um, which is Singapore's first digital financial advisor where you can invest your CPF. Um, so shout out to a few of my coworkers who are here too, like Ye Chong. Um, but I think it's a really small team, and I think it really excited to figure out how we can make investing for retirement a lot more approachable, um, a lot more transparent, uh, and a lot more low cost. Um, and so, yeah, I'm at endowers.com right now, um, and happy to share more or talk more about it if anyone is interested in investing in your CPF. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Um, so like interesting, right? Because you've joined, like you've worked at all the companies that I would love to work at one day, right? But if you could sum up like Cliff Notes version, right? Like bike dance, lift and Dropbox, like what's the most important lesson you learned at each of them? Um, I would say that um, the biggest thing that defines a company is actually its business model. And to me, I think that there are um, in general three business models to make money in the internet. The first is to build a SaaS company and charge an annual recurring fee or monthly recurring fee. The second is to build a marketplace. Usually a marketplace is a two-sided marketplace like Carousel where you have buyers and sellers and then you make the transaction fee. And the third is to sell ads. And ads most likely means gathering a huge audience and then monetizing them by, you know, by eyeballs. Uh, and so to me, I think the biggest lesson was that um, I was pretty... I guess lucky and maybe I was also, I intended to experience one of each three um, in my career. Uh, and so I started with Dropbox, which is SaaS, moved on to Lyft, which is a marketplace, and then to ByteDance, which is selling ads. And I think that to me, the business model determines a lot more than people see. Um, it determines your culture. At Lyft, it was a lot more stressful than at, at Dropbox because we live and die by the day or every minute, right? Because Uber would, would screw us up every, every you know, um, and, and not just culture, but also um, what, how your company thinks about product, how your company thinks about hiring people. Um, and so, yeah. Okay. Um, very good insights. Um, thank you. And um, so I, I think, uh, you know, JX and I were talking about this and uh, in, in future, like he too will you know, we'll get some homework and do a presentation and, and seminar of his own. 
So uh, you guys can ask him more questions then and you know, feel free to connect with him as well. Um, but a little bit conscious of time uh, because you know, I, I talk a lot, right? Um, so I'll kind of jump right in and then um, uh, go through my, my deck. I have a deck. Um, and then, um, you know, we can get questions kind of at the end. Okay, um, so uh, what is a decision tree, right? So this is the, the topic of today. Um, you know, you have a standard definition up there, right? But the really interesting thing about decision trees is that like, typically you just have to draw one and people are like, oh, that's what decision trees are, are right? So here's a very simple example. Launch A-B test for two weeks. If you get more than 20% adoption, full launch. 10 to 20% adoption, pause, pause rollout, figure out what went wrong, figure out what went right, then kind of iterate, and then less than 10% adoption rollback, right? So it's very clear that kind of all the possible scenarios are in here, right? Um, and uh, this is a very simple decision tree. Um, and and I'll, I'll, I'll be going through uh, the rest of the deck kind of actual examples of decision trees that we've used. Of course, I've uh, changed the, the numbers a little bit and changed the examples a little bit but they'll give you a flavor of what slightly more complicated decision trees might look like in actual product management at Carousel. Um, before we go there though, like uh, just a quick introduction to Carousel. Most of you are Singaporeans, so I'll, I'll kind of jump through this quickly, but it's basically a two-sided marketplace, right? I, I took this off the app store, right? Uh, that's why it looks so nice. Um, but um, you know, anyone can buy or sell, you can sell your items pre-loved, right? Get cash back. Um, discover secondhand items to buy, and then you chat with one another, right? And we also have a reputation system so that over time you get to know who your buyer or seller is and like, you know, they, they get their trust builded up. Um, you know, we've, we've been doing relatively well. So we are in eight markets uh, right now. Uh, six of them, we have uh, unrivaled number one positions. People think of us as like Singapore founded, but we're actually biggest in Malaysia, number two in Vietnam. Right, and uh, number three, number three actually is uh, Singapore and Philippines. All in all, we're talking about 40 million MAU. So I think in, in Singapore, we know Carousel as the company we, we love and that was founded here, but it's actually kind of spread its wings quite a little bit, you know, beyond the region. Um, so I'm going to go through uh, five examples or five features today to kind of elucidate five different lessons. Um, and so, you know, as, as we go through, I'll kind of like, like talk, talk these through. Um, the first one is a following feature. And again, these numbers and even this logic is not like factually correct, right? It's more illustrative. But um, here you see on the left, I've drawn a little box, right? I follow my boss, right? Of course, Tio Ray. Um, but uh, people I, I follow, right? And there's a hypothesis that we, we created. So this feature didn't used to exist, right? So then when we thought about building this feature, right? We created a hypothesis, right? Um, so, uh, seeing people who posted a new item in an interface we are used to, right? So, this is the interface that we see on in Instagram and Facebook, right? Would increase usage of the following feature and hence increase percentage of buyers by 5%. Um, and, and importantly, I think in this hypothesis, one of the best practices I like to do is kind of add why, right? So, because this is more relevant content, you don't just say, hey, I think it will increase by 5%, but you want to figure out why, right? So I don't think a lot of explanation needed. You look at this, you instantly know like what this feature is about. Okay, so we launched this um, earlier this year, about two, three months back. Um, so here was the decision tree that we had for following. Um, so uh, launch A-B test uh, and run until statistically significant. So we have like an automatic uh, system that tells us when it's significant. Um, if we increase bias by more than 1.5%, we launch. Okay, if we... Uh, increase by from zero to 1.5%, we still launch. Okay, no increase. Uh, then we kind of look at, is there any other growth metric, right? Um, yes, for example, we found that browsing behavior increased by 0.3%. Again, you full launch. No increase, you, you rework the whole feature. Okay, a um, couple of issues with uh, this approach, right? Uh, so not everything I'm going to tell you are like good examples. Right, uh, so a couple of features. The first is that there's no rollback scenario, right? Three out of four of the final scenarios actually call for full launch, right? Um, so, so that's not very good in that like people feel that like they're not actually um, kind of genuine and sincere about testing this, right? You, you basically say I can't be wrong, 
right? Um, even the last one is just rework. There's no rollback. Um, stage two brings up hype metrics. In this case, uh, browsing behavior, right? That was what was not in the hypothesis, right? The hypothesis was increased bias. And now we seem to have like randomly like added this added like behavior metric, right? The third thing is that it's not fully aligned. So like in Carousel, as I mentioned, we have like multiple directors, right? And um, there isn't a revenue guardrail, for example, right? It's very typical. Um, when you launch a product, there are interdependencies with other squads. Here, there isn't a revenue that got real. Now, the reason basically that all of this kind of looks like that is that this tree was actually created after the results were available. So we ran the experiment, we didn't have a decision tree, and then post the experiment, it became clear that kind of this was the decision tree we were looking at, right? Um, or, or what that product manager was looking at. Um, so what it should have been, right, like if we were to kind of turn back time, is, you know, launch A-B tests, again, run until it's significant, more than 1.5% in growth, okay, let's look at revenue to decide whether to full launch. Less than 5% revenue drop, full launch, right, like it seems to be worth it. More than 5% revenue drop, let's rework, right, let's see if we can bring down that revenue drop. Only 1% to 1.5% increase, let's pause rollout, because our hypothesis is not right. Right, it's proven that you know we haven't hit the impact we want, and then if less than one percent, let's roll back. Right, this is what it should have looked like. Right, and just a couple of things to note here. Right, like this content actually should be created and aligned before the experiment. Right, this is basically what you create and go to your your bosses and say, hey, um, this is the experiment I want to run. These are the possible scenarios. Right, um, revenue squad has agreed, growth squad has agreed. Right, we've kind of looked at it all. Are we all okay? Um, the second thing is that the decisions are not ambiguous, right? Once again, all the possible scenarios are thought of. Um, and lastly, there is a possibility of rollback, right? And I think this is really important because as a PM, the moment that you see that like there is a possibility that basically the users will pass judgment on you, then you start to become a lot more careful, right? You start to think about validating your, your insights a bit more, validating your hypothesis a bit more. You need to be basically confident. Right, because otherwise you do this whole experiment, the development work all gets wasted. Your engineers ask you, why did we build this if it was just gonna get rolled back, right? So it doesn't mean that you don't experiment, but it does mean you need to have a bit more rigor if you see that there is a rollback scenario, right? So overall lesson number one here, right? Like decision trees should be created beforehand, right? And you should align with all the like different relevant stakeholders. And you know, sounds simple, but like it should have a rollback scenario, right? Um, and Adding both of these things together, I think will really help you avoid bias and kind of make better decisions in the process. Hey, Jason. So just going to cut in here before we get into number two. Uh, so a few uh, quick questions that have come up. Um, yep. The two thing is, one is actually um, uh, slightly related, which is about your A-B testing framework. Yep. So the question here is that um, how important is the A-B testing framework and any quick tips on sort of how do you run this A-B test? Does it have to be double blind? Can it just be 50-50? Um, that's number one. And then the second quick question here is, does this mean that you should make sure that your company's data infrastructure and ability to get this data be super tight before you can do this? If, uh, unfortunately, you don't have a data engineer, um, would your advice change? Right. Um, yeah, I think that that's good questions. Um, so I think the first thing to note is that this is how we do it at Carousel. Right, but I've also worked at startups, and I think the important thing is the 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 thinking that goes into this. Right, I don't think it's very normal, especially if you have a new product, for example, for you to worry about statistical significance. Right, it could be, for example, this first box. Right, is like interview twenty people. Right, and if fifteen say that they are for this, right, we launch. Right, ten say that they are not for this. You know, ten to fifteen then you kind of re 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 rework, right? And less than 10, not a good idea to invest further, right? At the end of the day, I think we're all working in imperfect um, conditions, right? Of course, the better the data you have, the better the decision tends to be. But I think the important thing is to set this up in advance and use whatever data you have, right? And it's, it's actually most of the time, you will probably not have access to statistical significant data. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that also kind of answers, I think, your first question about A-B test. Yes, we do kind of double blind, we do cohort, we do all that. But again, if you don't have that, I've seen before versus after, right? I've seen surveys, I've seen interviews, right? I think it doesn't matter as long as you are really objectively trying to find out, 
right? Um, kind of what the users really think and whether your hypothesis is right. Awesome, gotcha. Okay, um, second feature, kind of shifting gears a little bit, interstitials. So the first one was a growth feature. This feature is interstitials, right? So how this works is we create an interstitial splash screen ad, which we can sell at high CPM, which is basically a high price. Um, and we hypothesize that it will come at a low cost of user growth. And the reason we think so is that users did not find this disruptive during the validation space, right? So, so again, that because sentence was actually quite important to convince growth to even let us try this experiment, right? Um, so this is the decision tree. In this case, like it's an actual decision tree. It's not, it's not a wrong one. Again, launch, right? Uh, no drop in buyer's metric. Uh, then we look at seller metrics to decide launch, right? If there is a drop in sellers, um, then let's limit audience to get it below Y percent and test again. If there is no seller drop, I mean, no buyer drop, no seller drop, basically you're saying no impact on growth, right? And you get money from it, full launch, right? If you get drop in buyers, immediately let's kind of limit audience to get it below X percent. So this is an example actually of like, there are very few scenarios where you, you full launch, right? In fact, there's only one out of the three scenarios that get it to full launch. And if you look at the other two scenarios, we say get it below Y percent. So the fact is if you can't get it below Y percent, this is probably like a no go, right? So points to note here, right? Um, ideally we will have X and Y percent set up in advance, but these are really complex questions, right? How do I really know actually, how do I kind of trade off a seller versus a dollar earned, right? So we're actually still finding good principles to set them, but the logic is kind of there, right? That like, hey, we do want to be measuring both of these things. And in absence of Y or X, you can just put like a, you know, 1%, for example, and we see what happens, right? But, but this is work that actually takes a long time, right? And the moment a user, a company actually understands, for example, customer lifetime value, that unlocks actually so much more you can do in terms of trading off revenue and users. But for Carousel, we're still trying to think about that, right? Like, how do we think about this? Is it cost of reacquisition? Do we think about one standard deviation, drops, you know, and so on? Um, still discussing and still kind of um, figuring it out. Um, second, as I mentioned, there's no rollback, but in effect, the others are really no go, right? If you can't get it below X or Y, right? Basically, this is not something that you will be able to full launch. Um, the last thing is, is interesting, right? Like um, we learned something in, like, surprising here, right? That like interstitials actually cause no, no buyer drop, right? Um, but you see, if you look at this decision tree, the buyer drop kind of came first because we were most worried about that. Right? We thought that like people open the ad, nothing to do. Oh no, here's an ad, like evil ad that, that's in your face, right? Okay, I'll, I'll just quit, right? So that was actually surprising and, and we put it there, but the results were surprising, right? So we're actually now in product discovery to like figure out why, why this happened basically. Um, and um, kind of the lesson here is that like decision trees actually help illuminate the trade-offs that you need to make across each other. So in this case, this is a monetization feature. But the whole decision tree actually is about growth, right? So it's really about saying, hey, as a monetization team, which, which I, I run, right? How do we trade off growth in order to achieve our goals, right? And at the very least, it begins this discussion, right? About how do we make them? Because the fact is that there are always going to be a lot of interdependencies because it's a single app. Cool. Um, so Jason, before we move on, um, I think there are a few technical questions that we can quickly get out of the way. Um, the first one is, how do you measure a drop in buyer and seller? Is the action or the trigger point there quitting the platform or bouncing or? Yeah. Um, so the, the way we do it here actually is very simple because this is an A-B test, right? So we basically look at like how many users there are in cohort A versus cohort B right? You run it for like a week and then you look at the difference, right? You would expect it to be 50-50, right? And if it isn't, then you say that there is a drop. Yeah. So it's not, not that complex. Got it. So it's kind of like active bias and active sellers. Yes, exactly. Gotcha. Um, and then the other question here is that, um, you know, there are always uh, experiment best practices. Uh, you know, for example, do not run multiple changes at the same time. But a question here is, how do you attribute causation if there are multiple changes in the product? 
and or the operating environment at the same time. And I think what this question really means is that at Carousel, you know, at, at a big company, there, there must be many experiments going on at the same time. Uh, and, you know, having an experiment run for a week without any other interference is almost like a luxury that never happens. Um, so yeah. how do you handle this sort of causation effect? Uh, yeah, I, I, like, uh, in, interesting question. Um, I, I'm not an expert on this. Our data team handles that but we have our own experimental framework. And I think we do things like time slicing, for example, where um, you know, we, we split people like into like 60 cohorts, for example, and you can have multiple running at the same time. Right? The fact is that actually the other thing is, um, as long as each like, round of experiment is kind of like independently and randomly sampled, it also doesn't quite matter if you have interaction effects as much. Right. But I think the, the, th this is a little bit of an issue, but um, you know, we haven't, that's, that's kind of why we do things like tests for statistical significance. Um, that's why we have best practices, like remove experiments as fast as you can. Um, but um, definitely it's not a situation where you have like one experiment running. I think there are actual like data ways to solve for this. Got it. Um, and the last question here, uh, which is actually on rolling back. I think the question that was asked uh, by Ealing is actually, why would you roll back if the new feature is not doing any harm uh, and you've already invested the effort to create it? Uh, and I think maybe applying it to this context, because I think you, you, you have already sort of shared a bit of your thinking, but maybe that is also where the emotional part comes in, right? The decision trees is supposed to help us to be super rational, but if yeah. your team has invested sort of like, you know, such a long time and you really believe in that um, and it comes, you know, basically the point where you have to decide, um, uh, would that influence your call? Yeah, I mean, so, so that's a good question and I guess that, that's like, um, uh, the, the fact though is that like, typically when you see, for example, so this one doesn't have a situation where there's no draw, right? But if we look at the previous one, right, this rollback, um, I think what you typically see is that like, um, you see a, 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 let's say no drop, no drop in growth, but you will still see something else in revenue, for example. You see something else somewhere else, right? And as you go down, the problem is that like, are you actually trying to justify keeping that feature or are you actually trying to justify kind of building like value for users, right? And I think this is not so much about like the emotional aspect and there is an emotional aspect actually. But I would actually then challenge the PM, right, to avoid this scenario, right? That's what, what I want them to do, right? I don't want them to roll back things, right? Because it means that we've basically been um, de develop shipping things that, like, ended up not actually being shipped, right? Um, but you're right, like, in a, in a case where there really isn't any harm, I, I think we can keep it. But then this decision tree will look a lot longer, right? It will say, no harm here, no harm here, no harm here, no harm here. Okay, let's <laughs> keep it. Yeah. And I think that's pretty rare. Gotcha. Thanks, Jason. Yeah. Okay. So uh, example three, um, moving on to kind of a, another growth feature, but kind of on the seller side, right? We had the buyer side previously. Um, so the, the former version is like after you've listed your item on Carousel, you'll basically see like a whole host of seller tools, right? Lovingly curated by my team, right? And what happened is growth looked at this and they're like, can we kind of, rather than try and sell to people at this point. Let's also like remind them that they've just done something good, right? Um, it's a growth feature, right? Like help them celebrate their success, uh, create some confetti, add some CTAs, free CTAs, right? Um, and we'll help, the, the hypothesis here was that all these things will help grow listings, grow selling behavior without hurting revenue, right? And the reason that they, they said is that the revenue features are still very, easily accessible and very high up, right? If you look at it, not that far different, right? Across the two. Um, so uh, again, launch the A-B test. Uh, no, no drop in listers. Okay, this was the actual decision tree. No drop in listers, potentially launch. If, you, if there is a gain in, in listers that outweighs the revenue drop, you launch, otherwise we work. If there's no revenue drop, full launch. Right, so, so the full launch scenario in this case is like nothing was hurt, right? Similar to interstitial, but in this case, it's like no growth drop, no revenue drop, okay, let's launch, right? So this is one of those scenarios of no harm, so to speak, right? Um, you go full launch, right? But if you see a drop in listers, then you do user validation and, and kind of rework the product, right? Um, and um, 
because that was the whole point, right? The whole point here was it should help growth, right? And if it doesn't, let's kind of do something about it. Um, so a couple of points to note here. Um, there is no obvious way to look at how this so-called gain and listers may outweigh revenue drop, right? So again, this interdependency is very similar to the problem that I raised previously in interstitials, right? And I think this is something that companies over time will start to learn better and better, right? Again, customer lifetime value, like what, what is the principle that you're taking to do these trade-offs, right? Because if you don't, then teams will always be kind of making decisions that require no trade-offs, right? That's not necessarily the best quality decisions. Um, the second is that, and here, this is interesting, right? The decision tree doesn't actually match up with the hypothesis, right? So if you look at the hypothesis, it says we will grow listings, right? We'll grow sellers, right? But if you come here, the decision tree actually says as long as there's no drop, we think that you should full launch, right? So this is really interesting. And you know, the, I think the reason for this is that this was a decision tree that was discussed, but ultimately wasn't documented, right? And I think when you do document it like that and you kind of compare it against the hypothesis, like you would definitely then go through this discussion of is this the best way to validate your hypothesis? Is this the best way to test your hypothesis, right? Um, so the overall lesson here, I guess, is that like documenting this decision tree really helps to clarify whether you are like creating fair metrics of success Right, that are really helping you test your hypothesis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess the lesson here is also, you know, as PMs, one of the things that we're also very good at is gaming our own numbers and gaming our own decisions, right? So that we sort of like get what we want. Um, yeah. And I guess documenting it is not just documenting it, but making sure to also update the hypothesis and yeah. go back and revisit that. Um, yes. Yeah, so one question here um, is, um, do you also use panels um, to test some features and why? So maybe in this particular one, and I think E. Young was asking, maybe also referencing to the previous example, but I guess that is where the whole qualitative side comes in. And maybe the broader question is, how do you introduce qualitative user research and testing and make it complementary to decision trees? Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I think very, very good uh, question there. I think that uh, the reason kind of all these examples are um, like full launch examples is that they've kind of made it to the, to the finish line, so to speak, right? But there are many more kind of ideas that kind of die on, along the journey, right? And actually a lot of them, like what, what we advocate is um, really kind of first test with a couple of users, test with data, right? You could even like come up with a hypothesis just based on data, create this decision tree for what you expect to see in the data, and then go get the data, right? That's I think called a natural experiment, right? And then there are also like surveys that we do. So once you've done the data bit, you've done the kind of one-on-one -on -one, like in-depth research with users, then typically we do things like we send out surveys, right? A little bit like a panel, but not really, right? Just to get a big like, like uh, a, a feel for like, hey, if we were to do this, right? How many percent of you will be like really keen on it? And, and you know, survey writing is also a, a, a little bit of a skill. You have to make sure not to bias them, right? But that is a way to validate, right? Because ultimately, I think as, as a product manager, the one thing that I always think about is that like, development work is really expensive, right? And only make that investment when you're sure, right? You don't kind of like say, that's a good idea, let's invest, right? You really kind of do your due diligence first. So actually we do all of those things, right? But the, the, the ones that I've shown here are kind of the ones that kind of made it to the end. But as I point out, actually you could use a decision tree uh, for data, for in-depth research, for surveys, really in any way that you wish. Gotcha, cool. Um, for feature pricing, so kind of jumping back to the money domain, right? Um, and these last two, these last two features and examples are interesting because they're where I, I advocate actually not using decision trees, right? So, so this is kind of the pricing of our products, right? Uh, monetization products. So there's a bump, uh, basically your, your listing kind of goes to the top and there's spotlight, which is basically a CPC pay per click, uh, cost per click type of model that we have. And you can buy like any one of these products, right? Um, so we wanted to do a pricing decrease, right? <laughs> Which is always a little bit of a dangerous realm to go into for a monetization team, right? Um, 
And uh, but but the context is this, right? We had done many pricing experiments in the past. We knew the elasticity. We had a good idea, right? I don't think you ever know, but you had a good idea. We have a robust model. We also use to like price to value. When you buy a bump, we figure out how many chats that typically like would would get you, and um, you know, we try and cost that like kind of uh fairly. Um, so actually, when we were considering reducing price, we simply set the KPI for price decrease. Right, so we said how many percent increase in revenue is expected. It's just an impact sizing, and then basically we told marketing, op, sales, product, everybody. Right, okay, this is the goal. This is what we've expected. Let's go do it. Right, marketing, go like get people to buy more of this. Right, tell everybody that we've done a price increase and so on. And the reason that we didn't do a decision tree here is very simple. Right, no hypothesis. Right, there's nothing risky here. We already knew everything we needed to do. Right, at this point, all you are doing is executing. Right. Um, so kind of the lesson here is that really if there's no need to validate anything, just focus on rolling out, right? You don't always have to use a decision tree. Yeah. Um, last, uh, last question, last example, sorry, last lesson. Um, so here is an essentials tag. Uh, you know, we just came out of circuit breaker, right? But um, two days ago, this was still relevant. I see it's still relevant now. Yeah, uh, but basically the hypothesis here was that this is the services category, home services, right? Um, and uh, with Circuit Breaker in Singapore, we hypothesized that buyers had trouble finding service providers who are certified as essential services, right? So the problem is that if you look at all these guys and you don't actually know who is certified essential. And so who can you actually chat with that can actually come and like fix your aircon, right? Um, and we didn't do this. We didn't do a decision tree for this for a few re reasons, right? First is we will be removing this tag, right? The moment like there is no longer a need for essential and non-essential, right? This will definitely come out of the site, right? So there's no decision needed there. The other thing is that we wanted this to go out ASAP, right? It's very time sensitive. By the time you finish testing, right? Like circuit breaker is over, right? Uh, we did, however, still have a hypothesis, right? Uh, so the hypothesis is that, hey, you know, they had trouble finding this. And if you had this tag, right, ideally, you should have a better response, right, um, for the category. So what we did is basically we just implemented this and we just did a before versus after comparison, right? So what we did is like beforehand, how many leads were being created in this category? Afterhand, after this tag, how many leads were being created, right? So some sort of a, your buyers should become more successful, right? Sending more chats and so on. Um, yeah, so the lesson here is, again, when the decision is already clear, you don't need a decision tree. And that doesn't actually preclude testing of hypothesis, right? You can still test, you can do like comparisons. In this case, we did before versus after. But really, a decision tree is most useful when you actually need to make a decision. And here, we didn't have to, to make one. So, yeah. uh, so, Jason, on this, part, this point, so um, a question that came up is, do you think it's helpful to, because, you know, of course, COVID is a special situation and we had to make the call very quickly, but do yeah. you think that it's worth to revisit this decision? You know, so for example, say tomorrow, everything is okay. And because this was such a major decision, one thing that might be helpful is to say, okay, so let's go back and see, have we actually made the, made the right decision? Um, is that something that you would think about? And if so, would decision trees also be helpful in the retrospective context? Yeah, yeah, I think um, absolutely, right? I think um, that, that's a good point. Um, and, and that's why ultimately we still wanted to make sure we had a hypothesis, right? I think as a product team, we need to always kind of maximize learning and optimization. And we always need to be measuring, right? We shouldn't just be doing delivery. We should be maximizing impact. And I think you're right, right? The whole point of that is that like, if this ever happens again, we would have learned from this hypothesis whether it worked. And then the next time around, we would be like, hey, was it a good idea the last time around, right? And hence, should we even, I mean, even if it takes only like two days of developer's time, that's still time, right? Should you make that investment? Um, so, so yes, um, we, we did think about that and that's why we made the effort to kind of hypothesize Right. The reason you didn't necessarily need a tree in this case is that it was quite simple, right? It was just like de demand improve or not, right? Yeah. Gotcha. Cool. Um, yeah, I think we can move on to the next slide. Okay.
Um, yeah, so so that's that's it actually. Like those are the five like examples. Um, so you have like following, interstitial, seller success, pricing, and essentials hacks. Just kind of a quick summary for everybody to like take it in. Um, and um, you know, just I, I thought it would it's interesting to just like create a decision tree for you in case you wanted to get started, right? Like if you have a project coming, um, if and you know. Firstly, do you have a hypothesis you need to validate? If no, then use KPIs, use OKRs, use before and after, right? You don't quite need a tree, right? If yes, then are you confident, right? Because I assume like some of you may not be confident. Some may be. If you are confident, draw a decision tree, start to align stakeholders, right? And do this before you start. If you are not confident, draw a tree for your own use, right? This is interesting, right? You could actually secretly be doing this, guiding your thinking, and I think what you will find is that like, you will be able to um, communicate your thoughts and your thought process a lot clearer, right? Because you start to tell people, this is what I thought about. And then I thought about this. And then I thought about this. And it just becomes a lot clearer when you talk in a decision tree, right? Um, and, um, you know, do this, use it to make a decision, use it to articulate how you're making decisions and kind of learn from your experience and adapt, right? So ultimately, um, you know, I'm, I'm not like the, 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 I don't have the final word on how to do this, right? So I think that, you know, it's something that you can kind of be agile and adapt to your own users as well. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Jason. So I think that was awesome. I think it was a really punchy sort of overview with a lot of real life um, examples actually from Carousel. And a lot of times from when, when we're looking at a product from the outside in, uh, you're always like, oh, wow, why are all these decisions made? Or sometimes it looks like your product is a lot more, you know, clear and good. But, you know, there's so many things that's going on behind the scenes. Um, I think one question uh, that came up um, from the attendees is, uh, the question was, who comes up with the hypothesis and decision trees? Is it the product manager? Is it the stakeholder who requested for it? But I think the bigger question behind this is, if I want to get started with decision trees, um, how can I do so? And I think that a lot of that has got to do with the company environment that you're in and whether this is something that people are used to or not. So I was wondering, maybe you could share a little bit about the challenges of you know, implementing a decision tree um, as well as who would be, is there such a thing as who would be most suitable to be driving and implementing a decision tree? Yeah, um, so, so uh, good, good question. And, and this is kind of why if you, if you look at this, right, what I suggest ultimately is like start with it yourself, right? Um, because like if you try and kind of drive adoption of a tool that you yourself aren't even clear of, and I mean, you might try using this and be like, oh, actually it really doesn't help me clarify my thinking, right? Then don't kind of bring it to market, right? Don't try and go and sell it and like ask other people to do it. So I think though that like once you become like convinced of this and you kind of know what it's used for and why, then I think um, a decision tree and a, a hypothesis actually, um, and I mean, JX, you, you can like chime in here. I think it's actually co-owned, right? And I think the best decision trees and hypotheses need to be owned by all the stakeholders. They all need to agree, right? The problem you have is like, if you have a product owner who says, here's my decision tree, and everybody disagrees, but like doesn't dare to tell him, right? Or disagrees and tells him, but like they agree to disagree, you know? Then I think you have issues, right? So I think product managers, at least the way I view it, is that you really need to view yourself as kind of the tip of that spear, right? You come up with it, but look, the whole spear needs to move together. Um, so ideally, you need to do work to make sure that everybody agrees, right, um, with it. And you can use various things, right? Like I said, we can be, you can begin with like um, using it yourself and just articulating true without showing people because people don't really want to learn frameworks. What they want to learn is can we make a better decision? What is important to make a better decision, right? And if you say here are the two or three things that I think we need to think about and you don't draw a decision tree, you don't like scare people with a framework, I found generally that that's an easier way to start getting it to market, right? Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. And Jason, if you don't mind touching on the common challenges, I know you prepared like maybe a few slides on it, um, but if you could talk quickly about the challenges, especially with regards to culture and with regards to actually being able to execute on that. 
Ya. Um, yeah. So, uh, interesting. Um, yeah, because uh, I, so, you know, just a little bit of, of background, I guess. Like, I, I created this as, like, internal training for Carousel. So, there are multiple Christians here, right? So, for example, my stakeholders and decision makers cannot commit, right? So, what do you do, right? So, I think, uh, so there's a suggestion here, right? If you can't decide what success, you really have no objective, right? So, you really need to try and clarify as much as possible to get to better, like, decisions. You don't have time to do a decision tree. It's another thing that I hear a lot. Um, and, and, you know, here, I, I think I, I want to emphasize again, right? Why I took pains to show... Um, yes or no, like who should use a decision tree in what cases, they're really not for everyone, right? They're really meant for maximizing learning, right? If you've already learned everything you need to learn, just go and roll out, right? Traditional KPIs work fine, right? Don't reinvent the wheel. Um, I would, however, caution, right? Like having been a product manager for so long, um, better results don't typically come with faster execution, right? Um, I, at least I personally, um, I, I used to joke that like 90% of the things I launched like had no impact, right? So I, I think that, um, you know, you just want to avoid going nowhere fast, right? Make sure that like you are going somewhere with these decision trees. Yeah. So um, this is very worthy slide, not really meant for presentation. Um, but uh, here are some other examples that you can pick in. Awesome. Um, and then another question that we have over here is... Um, Heng Hong, um, ever the futurist, um, asks, how do you think about building future decision trees on top of previous confirmed theories of successful hypothesis? And how do we use these decision trees to build a common mind space for product teams? So I think the interesting idea behind this is how do we um, sort of amalgamate the different decision trees that might have happened already? So instead of like, you know, like buy and then throw away or use and throw away, it's sort of like how have you had experiences in combining these knowledge banks and building on top of them? Yeah, uh, that, that's, uh, yeah, as you said, I think the right word is a futurist, right? Because um, it takes actually a while to get there, right? So I think that um, the, this, this um, what, what uh, Hing Kong, I think, is alluding to is a very pure and a very good way to really then kind of do the next steps, right? Because ideally, once you figure out like, what you have learned, what you have validated, this starts to become like a knowledge bank. This starts to become something that product managers understand more and more and more, right? And then you start to build on this, right? You start to build on like learnings. You start to tell yourself that, hey, I don't have to retest this because it's been properly validated, right? I think the challenge, of course, is that you sometimes need to ask yourself, has the situation changed? Right. So with, with COVID right now, I think we've had to think about like, do we need to revalidate some things that we had already thought we learned if COVID is going to last for like 12 months, right? From the start of this year until maybe the end of this year, right? But once you do that, then I think what, what it best serves is that like you need some sort of knowledge management, right? And let like various PMs start to like learn from one another, share one another. And just it's it's a it's a joy, right, to be really like taking an insight, understand that it's fully been validated, and then just say, I'm going to take this as the truth, right? And I build on it, right? Um, and then you start getting kind of multiple nested like um, things. And you can say these things have been validated, these things have been validated to be wrong and so on. Um, so I think that's where you start to go into like sharing and building on each other's work, right? Um, which is another good reason, I guess, to align to begin with, right? Um, and... Um, uh, so that different teams also start to understand how much their work might or might not affect each other. Gotcha. Cool. Okay, I think that we're nearing towards the end of the presentation. So I think the last part is really for live Q&A or if anyone have any other questions. But before we transition into that, um, I think as part of this, we want to do a quick, uh, so you know, guys, if you have any questions, now is a great time to raise your hand or you know, to type it in. Um, but I think a quick sort of a, a, a short I guess, advertising break. Jason, any quick plug that you want to make on behalf of Carousel or your team? Um, yeah, so I mean, Carousel is always uh, hiring uh, product managers. Um, I, I do actually like, like five to 10 like product manager interviews a week, right? So if any of you are interested, um, want to learn more about what it's like to work at Carousel, 
um, you know, things like frameworks like this um, attract you and working in a style like this attracts you, uh, feel free to connect with me um, and um, yeah, we can discuss if there are opportunities. Awesome. Thanks, Jason. Um, okay. And then um, um, I guess it's my turn for a quick plug before we switch into live Q&A. Yeah, um, go ahead. Uh, and yeah, so at, at, at Dallas, um, we're a small team of which I think 60% um, of us made up of engineering um, and product managers as well as designers. Um, and I think for us, um, as the first digital platform that can invest with CPF, we're really forced to rethink about a lot of, you know, the whole, how you invest your money and, you know, whether it's technically from the financial product point of view and from an engineering point of view from grounds up. So um, for us, if anyone's interested in, you know, exploring more, thinking about how investing your CPF works or thinking about how do we engineer a better solution, especially in educating Singaporeans on how we can invest and retire better, um, feel free to approach me anytime. Um, okay, so with that, I think that we have some time for a live Q&A. Um, and while we wait for people to raise hands, um, a question came in from Jonathan, which is, uh, how do you agree or align on the details in a decision tree? And I guess details could mean two things. The first thing is the percentages, um, which is the X and Y that you had previously. And the second thing is how many branches. Um, and it's interesting that Jonathan's question is specific to how do you do that in a large organization, which I think is a very natural next question, which is uh, what is the difference between doing a decision tree in a startup of like five people and in the bigger company. So I, there's a lot of questions, but I think the three main points is, um, number one, decision trees in big or small companies, there are different. Number two, how do you decide on the details? And number three, after you do so, how do you align it across the organization, especially if it's a big company? Yeah, um, uh, good, good question. So, so I think that, um, you know, I, I, uh, I'll take the last question first because it's the easiest one. Um, I think the fact of the matter is that like the smaller the company, the easier this is to do, right? Because all you need is, is almost like five people huddling around a whiteboard, drawing things up and say like, boom, you know, this is the decision tree we're going to use, done. We're aligned, we've agreed, right? And, you know, we're, we've kind of like stress tested this from multiple angles. This looks like a, a good decision, right? Now, the thing is that as you go to a bigger organization, um, and I don't want to touch too much on this because I think the reason it's difficult is just because stakeholder management is difficult in big organizations, right? It is not that decision trees are different. I think mm -hmm. even without decision trees, if, you, if I handle monetization, for example, and I go to growth in a thousand man organization, they will have many, many worries, right? Beginning with how is this going to affect my KPIs and ending with like, what if you are wrong, right? And that is true regardless of whether they are trees or not, right? I think it, what I found is that like decision trees actually ironically, um, or not, not ironically, but incidentally might help because if you show them that, hey, their concerns are already in this tree, right? Um, and, you know, there is a, a rung, there is a branch that shows if their concern really turns out to be true, this is what we'll do about it. Right. So you don't get, people don't get worried that like, hey, you're actually going to steamroll me, launch this no matter what. Right. Um, all the more, actually, I think you have the ability to show people that this, this decision tree takes into account what you are thinking. Right. And I would like you to also agree that this is worth testing. Yeah. Gotcha. Thanks, Jason. Um, okay. I think that we are at the end of our presentation. Uh, so if anyone wants to have any, you know, final comments or you know, final questions, uh, now would be a great time. Um, if not, I think that we can continue this conversation offline. Um, there will be a feedback form that we will pass it on and we're always available and happy to chat and, you know, and, and, and continue on that. So if not, I think that we can hand it over um, back to our SGN team. Um, so thanks guys for coming tonight and thank you to the SGN team um, for hosting this. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, GX. Actually, nothing to hand over. That's the end of the session. Uh, we will be sharing the recording of the session soon. It'll be on our YouTube channel. So, so look out for that if uh, you've got friends who weren't able to join us or if you want to just re-watch it because I think the content was really good.
Um, and then feel free to just connect with Jason and JX on LinkedIn. Yep, I think that's all. Uh, when you guys sign out of the, of the session, you'll get the link to the feedback form. Please help us fill it in so we can see how we can uh, organize future sessions. Yep. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Thank you.